Always a yell it is the foremost internationally acclaimed authority on developing true connections. A yell it is the founder and CEO of Universal Connections Inc., the world's premier relationship firm that is revolutionizing life through holism and truth. A highly sought life and relationship coach, professional matchmaker, astrologer, philosopher, and author. A yell it is always a yell it. Today's show is sponsored by Mount Gox, Mezzi Grill, and usgoldcoins.com. Thank you. And thank you so much for joining me again today for episode four of Always I Yell It. Um, what an eventful week we had this past week. We had an earthquake in New York City. We had Hurricane Irene hit us, and I was actually disabled for 36 hours with no power. Um, we had an attack in South Israel yet again, and we are approaching imminently the 10-year anniversary of 9-11. As such, I felt it important to discuss a very important topic tonight and introduce a very, very, very special guest who is joining me live from many miles away um, in the middle of the night, his time in Afghanistan, Kabul, Afghanistan. Uh, a dear friend of mine, Dr. Samuel Jouette, will be joining us in a few moments. And the topic I'd like to, my audience, I'd like you to keep in mind today is love. Love and fear. Love and fear, my friends, are the two prevailing deciding factors affecting people's lives. Unfortunately, at this time in, in life, in, in our, our evolution, our societal civilization, the evolution of our civilization, Fear seems to be winning the battle, and I'm trying to change that with my message of truth and my message of love. So without further ado, I want to introduce to you, um, I want to first express to all the victims of Hurricane Irene to please keep the faith. I, I firmly believe in God, the God, the source, the creator, whatever it is, however you want to define it. Uh, extracting religion from the equation, but that one source that we belong to that is one and that is all. And um, have faith and confidence. Believe in yourselves. Believe in who you are. Believe in the future. Believe in tomorrow. And we too shall prevail and survive even a hurricane or a power, power outage or, or material damage. What's more important is what's within and what continues on. Material, materialism goes and comes, money goes and comes, houses go and come, but our souls, if they remain intact, we will survive and prevail any horror or tragedy. Um, again, also to the victims of the attack in South Israel, my condolences are with the families of the victims in South Israel. I know this is news today, but you know what? It's a daily event in the state and land of Israel that there are attacks um, occurring. And um, we need to be vigilant here in the United States as well because the, the world is under attack. There is a war on terror um, pervading us and we need to be vigilant. We need to learn love. We need to learn to be informed. When you, when you have a question of something, go to the source. Don't just read texts that are just continuous propaganda and propagating myths, go to the source, go to the core, ask questions, question authority, question, even question truth, because if you question truth, in the end, as Sir, Sir Winston Churchill said, the truth is incontrovertible. Malice may attack it, ignorance may deride it, but in the end, there it is. So if you just question even the truth, the truth will prevail. And um, please keep this in mind at this very, very somber time in the lives of America and the world at large, time when 10 years ago now we became awakened for the first time in, in over 200 years to the threat of an attack, an insidious attack on our homeland. Um, yes, you know, Pearl Harbor happened in World War II, etc., but we were at war. And yeah, we were, I guess we could say we were japped at that time, or whatever the terminology was, we were taken by surprise, and those methods happen all the time in warfare. But to be attacked by an insidious army and an, insidi and an insidious mil militia from within our boundaries and to uh, 
create such an a catastrophic loss to our nation, to our people, to our city of New York, um, mustn't be forgotten, must not be forgotten. And so let's talk um, without any further ado. I want to introduce my dear friend, Dr. Samuel Jouet. He is um, coming in live from Afghanistan, from Kabul, Afghanistan. He's on the front lines and he's honoring me today with his presence via Skype in the middle of the night, his time, to talk a little bit about his experience in the Middle East. Um, he's been, in, I think, situated in the Middle East for almost a decade now. And uh, we're going to talk about his hands-on, front lines experience of what, what life is like in the Middle East, what it's like on the war front, and what we're battling here in the United States at this time, even though he's so many miles away from us. Um, so without further ado, allow me to introduce Dr. Samuel Jouet. Dr. Samuel Jouet is Capacity Development Coordinator at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Afghanistan. He has extensive governance, strategic planning, and human capital management experience. During his doctoral studies at the University of Georgia, he developed organizational diagnostic tools still in use today. His career has spanned service as a commissioned officer in the U.S. Army, teaching with the business faculty of the Stetson School of Business and Economics at Mercer Universi University in Atlanta, Georgia, and he was also a city manager executive of both Monroe, Georgia and Monroe, Louisiana. During his city management career, he dealt directly with state economic development and federal programs. It was Dr. Sam's job to shepherd creative initiatives that crossed the lines of local, state, and federal government agencies and related regional stakeholders. Today, his focus includes program accountability, relevance and timely production of practical results throughout the Middle East. Dr. Sam was an executive at the Jordan International Police Training Center. He served as an executive consultant to the Ministry of Interior in Ramallah for two years where he instituted strategic planning. He led business process re-engineering activities in the United Arab Emirates, and he managed programs for rebuilding public security infrastructure in Baghdad, Iraq. In Baghdad, Iraq. And without any further, further delay, please, um, I thank you so much, Dr. Sam, for um, welcoming, for, for, for being with me today on my show on Always Ayalet and joining me from from uh, Kabul, Afghanistan. How are you in the middle of the night? Well, I'm doing very well. Uh, you know, since we've come together, uh, I've already had two power failures and uh, lost our signal. So hopefully, uh, we'll have a good, strong signal and, and can finish our time together for these next few minutes, okay? No worries, no worries. If we uh, lose signal, we will just attempt to reconnect. So, wow, I am so, so excited and so honored to have you, Dr. Sam as my guest today. And I don't know if you, if you were able to hear the introduction I just did. My, my subject for today is the concept of love and how love needs to prevail and not fear and the fear-based theocracies that are attempting to pervade our world. And tell me, tell me a little bit more about what you're experiencing in Afghanistan these days. I know we just lost um, uh, our, Navy, our, our valued Navy SEALs a few weeks back in an attack. Tell me what it's like, what you experience on a day-to-day -day level, and tell me, tell me, talk to me. Well, uh, thanks again uh, uh, for allowing me to come on board uh, and, and be able to, to sit and speak with you, even though it's uh, uh, via electrons. Uh, uh, one of the things I do want to say before we get too far into this, uh, anything that I say today is really my own personal reflections and, and is, is not to be construed as uh, policy, official policy of the United States government. Uh, what I do for a living is uh, I've had the great opportunity to, uh, to go into different places around the Middle East, whether it be uh, Baghdad, Iraq, or whether it be in, in Jordan, or uh, in the West Bank, or uh, down in the United Arab Emirates, in Abu Dhabi, or, or now here in, in Southern Central Asia, in, in Kabul, Afghanistan. Uh, I've had the good fortune to be able to go into these zones of conflict uh, and be a person to, to help, the, help the local governments uh, reestablish themselves, 
and more importantly, uh, to be able to establish their capacity uh, to do the, the, the governing activities that we expect of, of stable governments that uh, have a concern for their people and, and want to be uh, actors on the world stage, uh, responsible actors on the world stage. I um, personally, personally, I personally love you for that, Dr. Sam, and especially the fact that you're extracting yourself from, um, po you know, United States policy, etc. Because it's your personal opinion that I value most. It's your individual perception, your individual experience, and your individual truth that is what is relevant to me and my audience. And so I'm deeply honored and deeply moved by your joining me today. And I trust that our audience will listen and learn and understand that I, you and I had a chance to chat. We've been friends for a couple of years now. And yes. we've, we've had a chance to chat many times. But in our most recent conversation, we went in depth about you know, how the people, the, the civilians in the West Bank, in the land of Israel, in Afghanistan, in Jordan, they, we, we all really love. We all really love life and love God and love... We all believe in my values and principles of having a love-centered life. But tell us a little bit about what is, what is going on behind the scenes that is not being explained. Explain what this war on terror is that, that you know, is getting whipped around and, and bashed by left media and left-wing media and right-wing media. And tell us what it is and tell us the reality of what is threatening us and our world and our peace-loving world of humanity? What is threatening us at this time? Well, you know, the last word you used, peace, uh, that's one of the things that strikes me, that when it gets beyond the politicians, when it gets beyond uh, the elected leaders, when it gets beyond the generals uh, that are, or, or the, the leadership of, of, uh, of the insurgents or those who who we, are, we oppose, those who we are confronting in the war on terrorism. Uh, when, when you get down and talk to and work with and be beside the people who live in these lands, uh, that's what's wanted. Uh, the opportunity to take care of one's family, the opportunity to, to uh, have a decent wage, the opportunity to, to not live in fear. Uh, that's one of the things that I, I see so often when I will deal with someone uh, who, will, uh, who, will, who will explain to me that, for example, here in Afghanistan, during the time of the Taliban, uh, how the fear that people had regarding anything from, from the style of clothing they would wear to being able to express their, their, their conscience as far as how they might feel about a neighbor or how they might feel about the way uh, the government was, was going or how they might understand how they wanted to worship. Uh, you know, the things, I, I yell at, that's one of the things that strikes me is that we have it so good in America as far as our ability to uh, worship the way we wish to, to, to express our conscience the way we wish to. Uh, these kinds of freedoms um, as trite as it sounds, or as overused as it sounds, these are so precious. Uh, I mean, the ability, look at it, you and I, a woman and a man, on, uh, on, on a free airwave, airwave uh, being able to carry on a conversation like this, this is incredible to be able to do this. Uh, to, to follow up with something you asked just a moment ago, what about the people? Uh, today is the first day of Eid. It's uh, the Muslim holiday that follows the month of fasting from Ramadan. And uh, I had to make a run to the airport uh, a little bit earlier today. And one of the things that struck me were all these families moving together, uh, the husbands, the wives, the children, the grandmothers, the aunts, the uncles. And they were going to be with their families to... Uh, have a chance to visit, to have a chance to share food. Uh, people were dressed in new clothes. Uh, that's such a shared experience across different cultures and different religions. This time of renewal, uh, this time of, 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 of a breath of fresh air that comes from, uh, from being able to get out of the house, to be able to, to, to live one's life uh, in this sense of, 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 uh, of uh, you 
you know, or, or being removed from the fear of what will happen to me uh, if I merely just step outside of my home. Right. Uh, like I said, as Americans, uh, we, we really don't realize how good we've got it. Well, um, with all due respect, Dr. Sam, how good we had it. <laughs> One minor correction, and you've been, out, you've been out of the States for a while, but we have an impending threat here in the, in the United States of an imminent attack yet again. I mean, that threat hasn't ceased. And we had it good based on the Constitution that our forefathers put in place over 200 years ago, which is why I love America with all my heart and soul, because only in America can those principles of freedom, of, of the pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and ultimate freedom can, where, where it can ultimately exist. And I firmly believe that it's every human being's calling to live such a life, even if you're in Afghanistan, even if you're in Iran, even if you're in Israel, even if you're in Jordan or in Lebanon or in Syria. It's every human being's right to live a life of freedom. But what is, what is, what is I believe, is threatening us is the is jihad. You know, when we were, I don't want to quote you because it's funny to quote somebody when you're actually talking to them. But you said something brilliant the other day, and if I may quote you to your face, you said, the only problem with theocracy is that everyone wants to be Theo. And what happens yeah. is, when you want to create a theocracy that is intent on, uh, or, or, is, or is crusading to annihilate all others unless they conform to one's way of being, that is not freedom. That is a fear-based, fear-instilled, existence that can only um, imprison or continue to imprison humanity and lives even if the people buy into the fear I mean I, I think that's what got the current leader of our nation elected he instilled fear you know it, it was a subliminal subversive tactic if you will um, it was an insidious tactic oh I am hope I am change and 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 you know and the lost sheeps were just we're following and what I'm trying to instill to our audience is don't just follow the shepherd question look around you have an intellect God gave you will and minds and ideas and thoughts and individuality to question things and if something doesn't quite feel right to you question it and then if, if at the end of your analyses you end up with a final answer and that answer it ends up being the ultimate truth, then so be it. And the ultimate truth will always, in my view, always result with love, with peace, with truth and honor and value and most importantly, life. Life, Dr. Sam. And when people take lives of others in the name of you know what their what their belief is or what their crusade is, we must question: How could this be? What what doctrine would would um, would would try to um, instigate such tactics? Defending yourself is one thing, but to uh, create an offensive attack in the name of anything is 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 an outrage and um and i and i know that the people of, Af of afghanistan and the people of the middle east predominantly the majority the civilians that's why they're welcoming the united states that's why they welcomed the american military in iraq back in you know when we when we went in in 90 in 2003 or 2001 whenever our first, whenever we first went into iraq after 9-11 is because they need liberation. They, I mean, the entire Middle East is revolting now. Now it's happening in Libya. It's hap it was happening in Egypt. Tell me more what that experience has been for you, Dr. Sam, having seen or having, what are they revolting against? What are they fighting? Well, you know, that's one of the things that, that with our attention so focused uh, on the wars in Iraq, the wars in Afghanistan, that it's been unfortunate that, uh, in my opinion, that we haven't been able to play or haven't had the wherewithal to play maybe a more important role in the Arab Spring. Uh, you know, the idea of going against uh, uh, some of the totalitarian, well, against the totalitarian governments, the oppressive governments, uh, whether it be uh, what was going on in Egypt or Tunisia or now in Libya, 
the things that we're seeing play out in Syria, uh, there really seems to be this uh, sort of perfect storm of activity that's going on. Uh, you know, think about it, since since uh, the, the terrible things that happened on 9-11, uh, you know, some of the positive things that have happened over, over the last decade, uh, if it had not been for the advances in technology and in social media and the ability to get the word out at, at really the, the proverbial grassroots level, uh, you know, think about all this, this change that has occurred, and it's not been by the superpower of America or the power of China that has gone in and flipped a switch and made people move forward for change. Uh, that's the kind of groundswell that's occurred, like I said, at the individual level. One of the things I love about what you're saying is this return to the concept of love. And I think this is one area that you and I definitely agree on, is that that's, 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 that's a thread, uh, that's a string, that's, that's, that's a common bond that no matter what, what language you speak or uh, what religion that one adheres to or doesn't adhere to, uh, but, but that's got to be the common thing that, that plays out across, uh, across, uh, across all the cultures around humankind. Uh, so uh, you know that that's one of the, that's something that I see as as a miracle. Uh, Yell it, think about it. You and I are are sitting at the threshold of, of potentially another very positive thing absolutely. to happen in our world. Absolutely, I absolutely one hundred agree with you, and that's why I know that the work I am doing, and I know that the work that you are doing, and all of my guests, the guests I've had on this show to date, and uh -huh. the guests I intend to have going forward. We are pioneers, we are revolutionaries, and we are speaking truth. And that's what I believe will prevail in the end. That truth is, it, it is what it is. And um, there's no controverting it, there's no deriding it. You know, it, it is what it is. And we need to be strong and to find the love within our hearts, make our choices out of love, not fear. You know, it's very interesting, Dr. Sam, I may have shared this with you when we, you and I spoke privately. When I was a little girl, my mother, my mother, God bless my mother um, with all that she is because she made me all that I am and um, I love her dearly. When I was a little girl, my mother is from Jerusalem. My mother is a third generation born, um, born in Jerusalem. She's Jewish. We're Jewish. From, my mother's from Jerusalem. Third generation born Sabra. And I know you know what that means. And when I was a little girl, my mother, would t my mother married an American man, my father, from New York. And I was, of course, born in New York. But when I was a little girl, as is typical for, you know, people that have uh, bilingual or binational homes, it's customary mm -hmm. that we go visit the mother's homeland for summer vacation. And so when I was a little girl, my mother would take us to Israel every summer. And we would spend two or three months. In fact, I spent most of my childhood and teenhood uh, as a teenager in, in Israel, all my summers in Jerusalem. And when I was a little girl, I remember going with my mother. My mother is, she's an Aquarian. She's a, an Aquarius. So she's, she's the first to be about love and humanitarianism and all is one and God is one and not to be, and, and to question authority and question religion. And we used to go to the old city in Jerusalem. I'm sure you're familiar with it. And it, it was, we was one of my favorite places. Yeah. yeah, one of my favorite places too. It's, it's heartbreaking because it was one of my, as a little girl and as a teenager, it was like the cool place to go. You know, and I remember the first words I learned in Arabic were alay khalik, alay khalik, because every time my mother would walk into one of the little shops in the old city, she would say adesh hada and she'd be negotiating, which is where I learned my negotiating skills. And then she'd walk out of the shop and she'd say, Alay Khalik, Alay Khalik. And, you know, we loved the Arabs. The Arabs, Arabs loved us. And so that was when I was a little girl. That was my first um, experience with, with, with Arabs and being a Jew in Israel and being an Israeli in Israel and my experience with Arabs. Fast forward to the time I was 14 and a half and it was my first high school, my freshman year of high school, my, during my high school um, years, I worked after school every, every day, literally, and saved every penny I earned so that I could go to Israel every summer. It was a way to get away from home, if you will, from, to get away from here. And I would spend two to three months by myself, all alone, on my own, visiting with different relatives, and spend my summer vacation in Israel. And I remember being a teenager, 
14 and a half for the first time in Jerusalem by myself and not having experienced Israel as a little girl being, you know, coddled by my mother and my uncles and my aunts. And I went into a department store and, you know, I had a handbag like all teenage girls have and women have. And I had a handbag. And when I walk into the department store, the Shechem in Jerusalem, the guy wants to look into my bag. And I was just like, you know, I was Miss America, you know, Miss America, pun not intended there. But I was just like, you know, Miss American, like, don't go in my bag. That's my private bag. You have no right looking in my bag. That was my response to this gentleman sitting at the door wanting to look in my bag. So fast forward, I later learned the importance of what it meant to my immediate American reaction, my immediate American response to an old man that's sitting in the front of a department store in Jerusalem wanting to look in my bag was offensive to me. My privacy was being evade, invaded, and, and what is that? I'm not accustomed to that type of thing. In America, I walk into a store, nobody asks me any questions. I am who I am, and everything is great. Well, fast forward from that experience, obviously I learned the importance of looking in a person's bag. Well, in 2003, I had an opportunity to go to a Yankee game with a very dear friend of mine who promised he was going to take me to a Yankee game at Yankee Stadium. This is the old stadium that used and now they have a new stadium that I haven't been to yet. So he was, I called him my pops. He, my pops was promising he was going to take me to a Yankee game. And this is 2003, August 2003. This is post 9-11. We're standing online in the Bronx, New York, to get into a Yankee game. And there was a long line, and they were doing a security check, apparently. And the guy in front of me were these liberal New Yorkers, excuse the expression, but they were complaining. I, I'm saving the expression, but they were complaining about their privacy being invaded. And I'm thinking, God bless you, open, check me, check me out, check everybody out, because that is what is necessary. That is what has become a necessary and vital and important part of our lives here in the United States as well. You know, when I used to, I used to do sales and marketing in Manhattan many, many years ago, and when I, I can't remember the countless times I would walk through Grand Central Station to get to the other side of, you know, to cross town, and I would think to myself, being an American Israeli, an American Jew, thinking that, oh, how easy it would be for someone to just throw a bomb in the garbage pail in the middle of Grand Central Station and just blow the whole thing up. No one's observing, no one's doing anything, and lo and behold, 9-11 happened, and what, what, what's happening, what, what, what is really, really scary is that the enemy we're facing right now is so insidious that the way they work is by pervading our walls, by being within us, and their, attempt, their goal is not to assimilate, although they appear like they are, their goal is to annihilate us and destroy everything we stand for, whether it be capitalism, whether it be our freedoms, Whatever it is that makes America, America, and I think what makes America, America is, or what defines America is freedom. And we, the people, governing ourselves, not being oppressed by any theocracy, by any king, by any sovereignty, by just being sovereign onto ourselves, if you will. And um, I just think my, those examples of personal experiences I've had from a little girl to, to recent years, that the importance of how we need to become vigilant on American soil now, and how we need to appreciate what our troops, God bless them, and protect them all, and you, God bless you, Dr. Sam, are doing for our, and we're not policing the world, we need to, we need to, we need to guide others. If we're leaders, leaders need to have guidance or else what's the point of their leadership or power? Um, but you were, you were going to say something. No, no, no I, I'm so sorry. The, towards the, the end there, the, the audio became difficult, but, but, but I, I understand what you're saying. No, I, but if I, I can continue on, uh, oh my goodness, uh, I really appreciate your stories. I, I remember uh, being in Jordan and uh, wanting to go to the mall. Uh, and before I had, had gone to Jordan, I had this image of, of, of a city of squalor, uh, an image of, of confusion and chaos and, 
and something that would just be so alien and foreign to uh, to my own personal experience. But I've gone to Amman, Jordan. I used to live in Amman, Jordan, and uh, it was just it was really wonderful uh, as far as the modern conveniences that were available. And where I'm going with the story is just once again seeing the shared experiences of of, of being able to make choices. Being able to go into stores, being able to to spend what money someone has to to choose to buy something that one wants. However, the twist was that I was in Amman uh, when the uh, hotel bombings happened, the night of the three hotels being God. bombed: the wow. Madison Sass, the Hyatt, and the uh, and the Days Inn. And it was amazing that in Amman, Jordan, in literally the blink of an eye that those citizens then began to experience what very much what you were just describing, and that is uh, a heavy armed presence uh, in front of uh, places with public gathering, be they movie theaters or, or restaurants or, or the mall, uh, a greater, a greater a visual presence of security on the street, and it really cast a pall over, over the citizenry as far as what's going on. Uh, and so, yes, uh, as I mentioned earlier in the show, as I was saying earlier in the show, uh, you know, our experiences in the States, it has changed since 9-11. Yes, it has. But, but even at that, the, uh, the, 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 the relative uh, discomfort, the relative change in our lives uh, compared to what I've witnessed, uh, the change in the lives of, of the people who live in a place like Baghdad, Iraq, or or in uh, or in the West Bank, or here in Kabul, Afghanistan, uh, you know, it, it's very severe. Whether it be uh, when one goes home, uh, I'm sorry, when one goes to work in the day, will that person uh, return alive, or will they be harassed or accosted, or quite frankly, uh, have to deal with the stress of life uh, that is ever present? It's a very uh, you know, it's it's a very, it's a very stressful life. It, it is a yeah. very, it's a constant stressful life, and um, it's, 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 um, it's sad. And you know, if people would just, it's, it, it's very sad. It's very sad, and it's, um, it's scary. And I think if the message of love got taught um, more emphatically, I. Th and not religion per se, but just this, the yeah. universal message of love, that God is one, that all is one, then I believe we can survive. Dr. Sam, please stay with me, my darling. We need to take a break to thank our very valued sponsors. We'll be a couple of minutes, and then I'm going to be right back with you, and we're going to continue our, our really great exchange. I'm so happy to have you. Um, it, while we take a break for a few minutes um, to thank our sponsors. I'll be right here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sam. First, I'd like to thank our very valued sponsor, MountGox.com. They are an online exchange services for Bitcoins. They now take Euros, British Pounds, Australian Dollars, and Canadian Dollars, continuing fees of 0.3%, and they have a two-factor authentication. And MezeGrill.com where authentic Mediterranean foods meet modern flavor. Now serving breakfast on 8th Avenue at 55th Street in New York City, just a couple of blocks south of Columbus Circle. And usgoldcoins.com. That's 1-800-HOT-COIN, our trusted advisor for investments in rare gold and silver coins. Andy takes the mystery out of buying silver and gold by holding your hand. They take a hands-on approach. Better to call and speak directly for current inventory. Again, that number is 1-800-HOT-COIN. And I'd love to hear from you. So if you would, give me a jingle at my Ask I Yell It voicemail. I know I have a lot of unanswered voicemails and messages from the last few episodes, but please bear with me. I will get back to you. Um, my number, my Ask I Yell voicemail is 212-569-6969. Again, that number is 212-569-6969. Or you can email me at ayelet at onlyonetv.com. That's ayelet 
at onlyonetv.com. If you ask me a question, I may answer it on an upcoming episode, and I do promise to eventually get back to everyone's questions at some point. Um, I also wanted to make a couple of quick announcements um, in addition to what I just um, uh, said. You can follow my dear friend Dr. Sam on Twitter at sjuet360. That's sjuet, S-J-U-E-T-T. 360. You can follow Dr. Sam on Twitter and learn about new development, developments in his life and his experience in the Middle East. Also, if you um, log on to alwaysayella.com, you will save $395 today, exclusively for only one TV viewers. If you register for a special coaching package at alwaysayella.com, you will receive an extra one-on-one -on -one with me at no additional cost. And Please don't miss the very important must read, The Value of Love and the Gift, which is authored, written, and composed by Always I Yell at Me. And it's available for a free download at www.ielletmedia.com. That's www.ielletmedia.com. And now back to my dear beloved friend, Dr. Sam in Kabul, Afghanistan. Dr. Sam, with all my heart, I've said this repeatedly to you in text and Skype and emails, I love you. May God bless and protect you for your service. I know you're a contractor, but your service to humanity is what I'm thanking you for and um, what you're doing on behalf of our country and on behalf of the Afghani, Afghani people and the people of the Middle East. And um, let's get back to where we left off. We were on a hot, 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 uh, Sub subject, we were talking about freedom and how our freedoms have been somewhat taken from us in light of this impending and threatening war that we're in the middle of. You know, uh, one of the things I remember immediately after 9-11, or shortly after the 9-11 uh, tragedy, uh, was Mayor Giuliani uh, coming forth and, and in essence saying life goes on, that, you know, the city of New York uh, is, is about recovery, is about being strong, is about moving on with life. And, um, you know, our, our conversation does, does continue to return to the idea of how the life has changed for us and how uh, the, the fear that, that many uh, experience, whether overtly or maybe at a deeper subconscious level, uh, is there, but, but you know, a, a part of life is living the life, and um, you, you're very kind, uh, your words as far as, as uh, what I do for a living, uh, coming here and working in capacity development with uh, the different ministries and the governments with which I work, a part of that is uh, recognizing that, that truly there's, there's a yearning, there's a desire uh, for us, us being the coalition, uh, uh, here either in, in uh, Afghanistan or in Iraq, uh, to find a reason not to be here any longer. Uh, you think about it. If it hadn't been for uh, what happened on 9-11, we wouldn't be here in Afghanistan, obviously. Uh, uh, and, you know, I, th these are a strong people. These are people uh, that, that very much would, would love to be able to continue on with, with their lives. Uh, do you realize that in Afghanistan... They have uh, been at war, in essence, have been in, at war for 30 years. Wow, uh, I, I realize I mean, this. I, do. I, I, was a, I was a young person. Uh, I, was, I was in college when, uh, when uh, the Soviets, uh, which don't exist anymore, uh, invaded Afghanistan. And, and, and what happened during their time here, uh, what happened during the time of the Mujahideen uh, pushing the Soviets out, and, and then the takeover by the Taliban. Uh, so imagine that. Imagine a generation lost uh, and tell the me, brain brain. Tell me, sorry. Excuse me for interrupting you, my sweetheart. Tell me about the Taliban. Tell me what they're, what were they doing there? What were they attempting to accomplish there? And how, what is the status at this time with the Taliban in Afghanistan from your perception? Well, from my perspective, uh, the Taliban are alive and doing well for themselves. Uh, they have the opportunity to play a very, very, very long waiting game. 
So uh, at the time when when we may decide to, to, to move out of here, or at a time when when our uh, own national will changes to the point where we no longer uh, feel that either by ourselves or in combination with the coalition that we want to have much of, of a presence here. And I'm not talking about just a military presence, our, our own diplomatic presence and our own aid presence. Uh, I am very concerned uh, that there will be a resurgence on the part of the Taliban uh, to come forward. Uh, Afghanistan is not an easy country. Uh, it's it's fairly large. It's difficult to get around. Uh, it's 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 besected by mountain ranges. Uh, there are are language differences between Pashto and Dari. Uh, there are cultural differences. There are tribal differences. Right. So you know we could spend the next three or four hours in, in a history lesson as far as how Afghanistan even came into being, given the. Uh, given the leaving of the British uh, when they held this area uh, as a colonial power and decisions that were made not by these people but by the colonial and western powers of the time as to how these different areas would be cut up. And, you know, what we experience in the early part of the 21st century uh, is a direct springboard from decisions that were made not by the indigenous people but by other people as far as, well, this will be what's called India, and this will be what's called Pakistan, and this will be what's called Afghanistan. Uh, and, and so uh, many of these issues were brought here uh, not by invitation, but by outside influences of, of, of strong powers that came and, and uh, thought uh, that, that there was a reason that they had a viable uh, uh, excuse uh, for being in this kind of area. Right. You know, you use the word, uh, an interesting word, and the word power, you know, strong powers, and I was actually, we had a, uh, a power outage for 36 hours because of Hurricane Irene, and during the daylight hours, I had no choice but to read, and so I was trying to catch up on some, I had no internet, no television, no computer to work on. So I decided to catch up on a little bit of reading and I was flipping through a must read in my library that I haven't yet had that opportunity to complete. The Prince, I'm sure you've read or heard of The Prince by Machiavelli, Niccolo Mach Machiavelli. And it made, it, it made me ponder, it made me think a little bit and you know, wh who, wh why he wrote the book, to whom he wrote the book and what the, per the message of the book is and who reads this book. And it's people seeking power, seeking to overpower others. It's a book of manipulation. It's a book of, okay, and do we need to overpower others, Dr. Sam, in order to be? Or can't we just be? Can't we just be, be you, be me, be ourselves, exist, and let others be? Why must, why is it so inherent in human nature to, to have this need for power, to, to lead, to oppress, to control, when what I've learned and in fact mastered in my short span on this planet is that that's an illusion anyway. You can't control another person if you're controlling, actually I learned this, my first relationship lesson when I was I think 18 or 19 years old, I mastered that you can control another person. If you're controlling another, and, and you know, I, I'm, try, I'm digressing for 30 seconds to introduce and to say that I know I'm renowned as a relationship expert and a per, you know, personal matchmaker, but my, the depth of me, of always I yell it, is far beyond you know, the one-on-one -on -one relationship because the principles that I'm teaching my individual clients or teaching individuals to look at within themselves and within their individual relationships, these same principles apply to the macrocosm of national and global politics and economics. And if in a love relationship, in a love relationship with your wife, with your partner, with your spouse, there mustn't be an ego. If you have an ego, if you have a will, an emotional need to control or possess your partner, then my darlings, no matter how much caring there is, no matter how much, and even with your relationship with your children, being a father, being a parent or a mother, if you have an inherent need, yes, discipline is necessary, but only with love, only in love. If the discipline is coming 
at a, in a context of the, the parent's emotional need to control or possess, it's not love and the children feel that, sense that and rebel against that. Hence is true in a one-on-one -on -one relationship between a husband and a wife, between two partners, between two friends, in, in a business relationship. If one partner has the um, inherent intent to control or possess the other, to dominate the other, to oppress the other, to make him gratify, to feed his ego, that's not love. No matter how fulfilling the, the person is, no matter how great the sex is, no matter how great the conversation is, if there's an emotional need to control or possess, it's not love. And this, my darling Dr. Sam, holds true in the macrocosm of global and national politics. Why must man always, animals don't, animals just want to survive. Sometimes they have to kill other animals to do so, but they don't try to reign over each other. They don't try to destroy complete and other, un, 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 total species because they're not peeling their, you know, their bananas the exact same way or whatever it is they're doing. Why must humanity always have this, this why must they let their fear and their, their, their insecurities and their sense of inferiority propel them to dominate and oppress others? Why must they be propelled by this fear? Well, see, I, 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 think, I think brilliantly you've answered your own question uh, in that uh, when there is that expression of power and control, whether it be uh, at the individual level in relationships or whether it be you know, at the macro-national level, uh, I, I, I think, number one, it's an expression of weakness. Isn't that counterintuitive? Abs absolutely. The whole, the whole idea to think that that uh, expressing power and control over somebody would actually be an expression of weakness. Absolutely. But maybe the baseline of all of that is a fear. Instead of coming forward and saying, I don't know why you are hating us, why you are hating me, why can't we understand what that is? And maybe there is a misunderstanding of intents or desires or what, what one is grounded in believing as the, as you say, the truth, you know, instead of that, we defer to uh, having these, uh, having this desire to express our power either through sheer might or the, the power and sheer ability of, of our economic strength. And by expressing those things, those kinds of powers, we diminish what that power has either resource-wise or our ability to hold it as a form of suasion that is what we can convince others to do without actually having to expend that resource or use up those resources in a in a uh, in a uh, uh, uneconomical way, and it further diminishes us. Uh, you know, I yell it. It's hard to fight ten years of war on two war fronts and not experience. Uh, a severe loss to our national treasure, whether it be economics, whether it be uh, the, the, the blood and souls of, of, of the men and women we've sought to fight, or whether it be the, the national fabric of, of our own consciousness, what defines us as, as to who we are. Uh, once again, I'm not going down a long trail to, to talk about as many things as I can think of uh, that have happened over the last 10 years. But we as a nation have expressed ourselves in ways that, that uh, you know, seem counterintuitive to uh, the, the core values or beliefs uh, within our own constitution. Absolutely. I love about talking with you. That's one of the first things you talk about is, is you know, that grounding in the constitution. Absolutely. And it's very sad. It's very disheartening. It's very discouraging. I know there's a great surge online, on Facebook, etc. But it's going to take more than that. And, and, yes. and, even, and even these activists online, some of which are, are, are also being propelled by fear. Whether it's me speaking and you're listening to me and you're believing what I'm saying, or it's you speaking and we're buying what you're saying, or if it's the people in the White House, we won't even mention their names. Investigate, question it. Don't just hear a word, associate, you know, I made a comment, I think, on my Facebook about, you know, the macrocosm of global 
what I'm doing is trying to reteach people the importance of love, making love based choices, not fear based choices. And these choices also will affect our economy. We're so afraid of tomorrow that we're not spending today. And if we spend today, guess what? The, the, the economic chain will continue to move itself. So we need to believe in today. We need to believe in tomorrow. We need to believe in ourselves as individuals. We need to believe in our families. We need to believe in our community and we need to believe in our nation. Our nation, the United States of America, the American nation, the American people. And in so doing, you know, I have a very dear friend who's, who's trying to, um, you know, get the government to start charging tariffs. Do what the other governments are doing. This open trade is nonsense. Why are we giving them the milk for free when everybody else is charging us and they're using that power to destroy us economically? We should stand strong. And that is love. That's not, that's not a fear-based, you know, having, uh, charging other nations tariffs for their products and services isn't a fear. It's a national concept. It's a nationalizing concept that strengthens the, the United States. It's, it's self-love. I always say, you know, in, in personal relationships, love yourself, love yourself. And as Americans, we need to love ourselves. Love yourself as an individual. Love yourself as whoever you are. And if it isn't right and if it isn't love, then end it and move on. But, but, and make it right. And find the people with whom you can make it right. But you must, we must love ourselves as individuals and as a nation and charge other nations' interest, charge other nations' tariffs so that we can exist. This is ridiculous. They're coming here. Illegal aliens are coming here, living off of our welfare system, which is being extended and extended and extended, getting unemployment checks, and Americans, American entrepreneurs, are fighting for their lives to try to, 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 to hire employees and to try to earn an honorable dollar. And what's happening here, I know you visit uh, um, intermittently, you come home to Wisconsin to visit the United States, but Dr. Sam, it's... it's the America in the Jew and especially New York. I'm a New Yorker and I was working in Manhattan, but the, the highlight of my career in the 90s when Giuliani was in, in office here, who I deeply admire as a, as a leader and as a politician, even though he might be flawed as, a, as an individual man, God bless him too. But my, my point is that, that we, need, we need leadership. We need real men with brains and courage and and encourage to lead us, not, not to oppress us. And sometimes certain, like a father will discipline his child or maybe spank his child because he doesn't want him to get hurt by playing in the street. Sometimes leaders must impose certain um, restrictions on their children or limitations on their children in an effort to teach them out of, at, at, at an, in an act of love, and if a child is intelligent enough, he'll question his parents' behavior, and he'll say, oh, well, maybe mom and dad really do love me. Maybe they don't want me playing with so-and-so because that wouldn't be a good idea or, or whatever. And, and yeah, so, well, I'm sorry. I we was going to say, an, an, extent, an extension of your, your analogy, which, which is really, I think, going a, a pretty good path here, uh, is the idea that we live in a civilization. And a part of what defines us as a civilization is our civitas. Uh, those are the policies, the rules, the laws that, that, we, that we buy into, that we behave under, that we act under, that we associate with each other under. And the strength of how that law uh, moves in and among us is one, grounding in the Constitution, that, that, that philosophy uh, that is well articulated and, and is something tangible as well as spiritual in many ways. Absolutely. That we can refer to. But Absolutely. also we have in general uh, the belief, the assurance that there is, that there should be blind justice, that there is blind justice, and that whether uh, it's, it's you as a woman in New York City or myself as, as a man uh, someplace in the Midwest, uh, that there will be an equality to how we are treated based on the very humanness of us. And that's the quality, that we are a human being. 
Absolutely. And, th and that's, th that's the bottom line, I believe, is that we are all human beings. What we do in our lifetime, in our short span on this earth, and we pray and wish and we have this strong... In fact, my next show, I'm going to be talking about that subject specifically, um, which I hope, and I know you'll be tuning into it, it'll be a really good show. Um, the, the will, the human will to live and, you know, who are we to decide the, the, the fate of other people, of other nations, of other, but we must, and it is written in the Torah, in the Old Testament, in, in our constitution of the, United, of the United States of America, we must defend our life, our liberty, and our pursuit of happiness at all costs. And that is the war that we're fighting on terror right now. And it needs to end. And I, I like all oppressors, like the Nazis, the Nazis were eventually um, diminished. And, um, well, who knows? Maybe they're scurrying around still. Um, we're almost out of time, Dr. Sam. But I, wanna, I want to, yeah, I know. Doesn't time fly when you're having fun? I'm always told that time flies with me. But I want to see you again, Dr. Sam. I want to see, I want to have you on again. I'm thinking about doing a, a, a commemorative episode for 9-11 in a couple of weeks, but you and I will touch base, and at our first opportunity, I'd love to have you back on again. This is such a, a very, very important topic, um, very dear and, 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 and dear, close and dear to my heart, personally, individually, and, um, and for all who I am and what I stand for. And um, I, I really hope that the audience, um, you know, just open your minds, open your hearts, and receive the truth that is, that is logic, it is ration, that is love. Love is not an emotion. It is rational, it is logical, it is real, it is truth. And if you can only open your minds and hearts long enough to understand this, we will be able to join together to fight all enemies of love and um, eventually um, defeat the fear that is pervading us. Dr. Sam, I love you with all my heart and soul. God bless you and protect you from all harm. I know you're not in the safest place in the world, but you're in my thoughts and prayers always, and I added you to my list for the Sabbath candles too. And if you oh, want to just say a few fi if you want to just say a few final words before we tune out. Oh, the final word is please. Uh, however you feel your soul and heart and mind and spirit moving, focus on peace. Focus on staying uh, free from fear, and uh, and that uh, the things that we do, we do for, with, and about each other in a positive way. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm, I'm in. I'm into that. And God bless. Um, at that, my my friends and my my audience, I want to thank you again, my my beloved audience for your continued um, following me and joining me every week on my show. I'm sorry I missed you Saturday night because of the hurricane, but I'm here today and I will be here again Saturday from 6 to 7 p.m. live from OnlyOneTV.com. I love you all with all my heart and soul and please just be love, be love, be truth, be love. I know it isn't easy, but it's 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 so much more worth it in the end and so be love um, as I strive to I am always um, I yell it I am always I yell it until next week God bless and with all my love kisses <laughs>